fracking along the, the Gospels. And last week, we, we started our new devotional series called From Death to Resurrection. From Death to Resurrection. If you have not picked up a copy, um, I, I, uh, there, 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 there is a table up out in the foyer. You can, you can pick one and uh, you can follow along with us. And also join a group. Uh, and uh, and you can uh, you can you can journey along with us. If you are confused, like I said, if if you, if you don't know what to choose from or uh, how do I discern which group is for me, uh, there is a leader out there uh, in the in, uh, in the foyer on, on, in, in the table. Please uh, please uh, go there. They will answer your questions and they will help you uh, register for that as well. So uh, we've been in the Gospels for the past few months now. And as the title of the new devotional book suggests, we are in a very interesting and important stage in, in the life of Jesus. Last week, Mel uh, shared with us from Matthew chapter 21, where the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a donkey is recorded. That event actually marked the beginning of the end of the ministry of Jesus on this earth. This week we are in, 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 in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, you re- if you've been reading along with us in the devotional material in this book, you might have noticed that they, they have titled this week as the provocative prophet. Provocative prophet. And use the entire chapter that's found there. So as I started preparing for the sermon, I, I, I had a tough time settling, settling on, on the portion of the scripture that I could share with you today. Because this chapter has four unique incidents, each of which can be preached on, on its own. No, they can be a sermon on its own. I was torn whether to pick, you know, whether to stick with one incident in the chapter or, or pick a few, few incidents and, 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 and do our, our meditation. Finally, after much deliberation, I decided to go with just one incident, which I found was, was very important. Uh, simply, I decided that because I, there's so much in these words, I don't think I could do justice to the text uh, with the limited time that, I, that we have here this morning. But I encourage you to read through the rest of the chapter during the week and, uh, and, and, and meditate on, it, uh, on, on the book as well. And, and if possible, discuss it with a smaller group sitting. So I'm sure it will, def- it will, it will enrich your understanding on God's word. All right, enough of, of, of that. Let's dive into the text for, for, for us today. It's taken from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Uh, the scriptures will be displayed in the screen behind me. Uh, if you wanted to follow along, uh, I'm reading from ESV version. Matthew 22, 34 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence, Lord. And we ask that you will bless our time together. Lord, I pray that you will reveal your truth uh, from these words. And I pray that uh, our, the meditation of, my heart, of our hearts and the words of my mouth will be pleasing to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I am not a big fan of tests. I'm not smart. I don't like tests. I never liked it when I was young. And I don't like it even now. Okay. But these days, the kids are really smart. You know, when the teachers get smart, you know, they try to trick you and the kids, they get smart too. So I was online looking at some of the questions, you know, teachers ask these, ask these, ask the, ask their students. And I was surprised how these kids answer these questions. Even the, the teachers might have been surprised by the answers. So let's look at some of the, some of the answers that I saw. All right, the first slide. 
So the question is, what ended in 1985, 96, 1895? <laughs> I, I love history, but, but, I, but I've never seen a historian like that. Okay. Uh, okay, next slide. So math is not my, my, my strong suit, but, you know, that, it does sound correct, right? You expanded that. Any math genius here know the <laughs> formula for that? All right, next one. Next slide. If you can't read the question, uh, if you can't read the question, it says, uh, assume the role of a Chinese immigrant in 1870 and write a letter home describing your experience. <laughs> I, I, I don't know Chinese, but I, I, I hope it's decent, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, um, another one. Next slide. Uh, here's another one, math. So I'm not a math genius. That's, I, think, I think that's about right. <laughs> There's X. All right, next one. X and one more. So, <laughs> so... You know, I don't see anything wrong, you know. Water, ice is water, it's hard, and melts and becomes water. <laughs> All right, another one, last one. So that question for the extra credits. What's the strongest force on Earth? <laughs> I think he's in a different world altogether. He's in a dream world. I think he'll become a philosopher one day, even better than Plato. <laughs> so... So these kids are smart. As I said earlier, I, I am not a very smart person. I don't like tests at all. Exams strip me, and, and I get very anxious. Um, last weekend, I was writing my English proficiency test. I was preparing for the entire week, and, uh, you know, I felt out of, out of touch initially. And, uh, but when I sat there for my exam, you know, I, when I saw those questions, teachers trying to trick you with these, like, little details, and, you know... It all went good. But you might wonder why Ragland is talking about tests and exams. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask any, any, any questions uh, from the Bible today. But the background to chapter 22 in Matthew looks like Jesus was sitting at test. Being questioned on scripture and the things of God. But all of these is nothing too new to Jesus. Being questioned uh, is not new to Jesus. But the, but the intensity and the intentionality to trump Jesus in his own words was way more evident in this chapter. If you look back and, and, and map the chronological sequence of events, all of these events and discourses uh, that Jesus gave in, in chapter 21, 22, 23, and all the way to the end of the book of Matthew... All happened in one week. On Sunday, Jesus made the triumphal entry. That's the passage we looked at last week. On Monday, Jesus curses the fig tree and clears the, tremp uh, clears the temple. And the day after, on Tuesday, he comes back to the temple to face the questions of these religious leaders. And that's the passage we are going to look at today. You might ask, what is so significant of this interaction with these Pharisees? With the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Let me tell you, this is happening on Tuesday. And by Friday, Jesus was betrayed, put on trial, and was crucified. That's how fast things escalated. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were, were desperate and were, were, were continuously bombarding Jesus with questions. In verses 15, if you look at the passage that precedes this, uh, in verses 15 it says, Then the Pharisees went out and plotted how to entangle him in his words. They were plotting and trying very hard to trump him, catch him in his own words. In that passage from 15 to 22, the Pharisees questioned Jesus about, about paying taxes to Caesar. They were hoping that, that Jesus would say, you don't have to pay tax because, because he was teaching about the kingdom. So they thought they could catch him on that. Again in verse 23, the same day the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection and asked him a question. The scripture says that they got together, came to him, and asked him a weird question about resurrection. You know what that question was? 
The question was, whose wife a woman would be if she had multiple husbands? That is weird, isn't it? If you notice, they framed this question because, because it is out of the Old Testament, Old Testament scripture. But these, these, these leaders, they were twisting, they were trying to trick Jesus. These religious leaders were, were willing to go to any laws and willing to twist the scriptures to somehow put Jesus to test. And as we continue along through the chapter, finally, 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 someone asked the question that, hold, that holds any substance. In verses 34, it says, Then the Pharisees heard what he, uh, that, that he had silenced the Sadducees. They gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. The question was, which is the greatest commandment in the law? What is the greatest commandment in the law? Now you might wonder, now you might think, why, why this question? What is the background to this question? You know, we understand that for Pharisees, the laws and the prophets are very important. Fulfilling the law is high on their priority list. What these religious leaders did not uh, what these religious, did, uh, religious leaders did was to put a weight on each of the 613 Old Testament commandments. They subjectively put more weight on whatever law th they thought was more important than the others. And they constantly debated within themselves which law is more important, which law carried more weight. No wonder they wanted to know what Jesus thought of this. They wanted to his opinion on which law carried more weight. If he said one, they would say, no, this carries more weight. They thought they could trick him. What is the greatest commandment in the law? Friends, the answer really surprised the Pharisees. This is one time, this is one time Jesus ever replied to a question with a straightforward answer. This is the one time Jesus answered them straightforward. In all the other places in the gospel before this, whenever someone put forward a question to Jesus, you might say, Jesus, is there an answer in there? You know, is there an answer in there? Sometimes you feel Jesus <laughs> deliberately confused the questioner. Now what is the difference about this question that made Jesus answer this way? Jesus gave this straightforward answer to this question because he, knew, he wanted his disciples to know what is required of them. He didn't want any misunderstanding on this issue, on this topic. They don't want to, he didn't want his disciples to misunderstand. He wanted them to be clear on what is required of them. So what is Jesus' answer to the question? Jesus says, love. Love. In verses 37, it says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, loving God and others are the greatest commandments in the scriptures. And honestly, I don't think the Pharisees were ready for this answer. They must have been surprised. Why? Because for Pharisees, the ritual purity was more important than any other commandment. For them, heritage is more important. Tradition was more important. They knew loving God, loving others are commandments. But for them, ritual purity was carried more weight. More weight than loving God. Friends, that's why they were surprised. Jesus very plainly and simply places love as the foundation of Christian living. He declares the supremacy of love. It's the first thing God expects from us is love. It is foundational yet so vital for our Christian living. 
how you might say, what is so unique about this commandment? You know, it's universal. We all know we, we need to show love. We need to love. Is Jesus teaching something new? What's so unique about this commandment? Let me share with you four things that, that God placed in my heart. Firstly, the pervasiveness of the command. The pervasiveness of the command. In verses 37, Jesus replied and said to him, said to the legal expert, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. At first glance, it might, it might, it, this sounds like familiar to you. Yes, it is. For the Pharisees, was familiar. This is not original to Jesus. He wasn't teaching something new. In Jewish writings before Jesus' time, these two commandments sum, summarize the whole of the law. In fact, Luke's gospel attributes this, this summary to uh, not to Jesus, but to a Jewish lawyer who asked Jesus what he must do to receive eternal life. In Luke chapter 10, you see that uh, in verses 27 and 28, it says, He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your strength and your neighbor as yourself. Friends, every Pharisee, every Jew knew these words. These words are the essence, the beginning and the ending of Jewish piety. It comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5, which is, which is actually called as Shema, Shema in the, in the Hebrew. It is the quintessential Jewish declaration of faith. It says in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one, and you shall love Yahweh with God, Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The tradition is when you say this, you close your eyes like uh, uh, eyes, eyes with your hands, and recite this. Every day, this Shema is to be recalled in the morning and in the evening, when you wake up, when you sleep, when you eat. They were taught to children, and they were even recited just before a moment of the moment of death. It was so integral to their lifestyle. The important question, though, for us today is: This is not just a ritual. What does it mean to love God? What does it mean for a Christian living today? What does it mean to love God with, a, with all of our heart, mind, and soul? Friends, the key problem is interpreting this commandment for our time is that we lose sight of the biblical meaning of love. Our culture has equated love with intense emotion. We equate and place love along the same line as like. You know, to love... For us, it's, it's, it's a stronger response to than to like. And both are measured, uh, measured as a passive response to something that is outside of us. You know, for example, if we, we like chocolate, we, because, and, and we cannot help ourselves. You know, we, we, love, we love a movie because it entertains us. We love hiking and, 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 and beaches because it gives us gratification and joy. We love a boy or a girl uh, because they make us happy. We love our spouses because uh, they, they complete us. Is that what loving God really comes down to, really? Friends, biblical love is not passive and it's not strictly emotional either. It's the active response to the love of God. We need to put special attention here on the words that are used here. The command says, love your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. These words, these words have some overlapping ideas. However, the key is we should not parse these words into separate categories but rather we should, we should express the pervasive way that loving God must fill every part of our life. 
in biblical understanding the heart is the core of the human person the seat of thinking willing and and, and feeling to love god with with one of one's heart is to to love him and uh, with with one's being the word soul uh, is 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 uh, is translated in other places as life life it means one's living the word translate uh, to love god with all of one's soul is to love him with one's entire life and energy the final word the mind uh, in deuteronomy where the, the 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 original reference is taken from there we use to see the word might here jesus or matthew uses the word mind once mind involves their thinking and understanding so to love god with all of their mind is to live completely focused on him heart soul and mind friends they are not three different three components of a they are not three components of a human person but three ways of expressing the whole person we are to love god with all that we are we are to give god what belongs to him which is our entire self Friends, love is not entirely an emotion. Love is a decision we make and have to remake again and again and again. Love is a choice we make about whom and what we will allow to be important to us. And based on those decisions, love then becomes something that we do in our everyday life. Friends, if we, when we listen to God intently, paying close attention to his words loving god with all of our heart mind and soul means choosing to listen to what he has to say and to obeying by his word and it's it's what i will become not what i feel it is what i will become not what i feel and this command from Jesus is challenging us to make God the entire center of our existence our thoughts our emotions our actions and every aspect every part of our lives this is a pervasive command secondly the love is demonstrated to around the, to those around us it's an extension of the command you know uh, in verses uh, the original question was the uh, of the pharisees was what is the greatest commandment in verse 37 jesus has already answered that question he said love your love, love love your god with all your heart soul and mind you might think this is it but jesus did not stop there he expands on the first commandment he graciously he graciously gives a second answer to the to the question in verse 39 says and the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself because the second commandment is take is taken straight out of leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 it's interesting matthew uses the word like here the greek word has the connotation of the sameness which basically means the second commandment is of the same nature of, as of the first and it also means it has comparable value it is equally important as the first commandment friends when you read when you read the, uh, when you read you might wonder jesus says neighbor who is the neighbor the context in the book of leviticus is where the original text is referred from the word neighbor meant a fellow israelite uh, and it was limited to the boundaries of the nation However when Jesus talks about love he removes those limitations he removes those boundaries the first time Jesus quotes the commandment to love one's neighbor uh, is found in Matthew chapter 5 verses 54 uh, in in the sermon on the mount very for he says i said you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you pray for those who persecute you 
Friends, we are called to show love to even our enemies. Even those we cannot love because of the hurt and harm they did to us. Even those, those who continue to harm us and hate us. Showing compassion and mercy to those in need is showing the love of God. In another passage in Luke chapter 10, a very familiar passage to us, this tells the tar- parable about who a good neighbor is. This is a very familiar passage. It's a good Samaritan story. After narrating the story, Jesus declares in verse 36, Which of these three proved to be a neighbor to the one who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed mercy. The one who showed mercy. Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Friends, Jesus calls us to show mercy to those around us who are in need. And there are so many plenty around us. Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, the religious leaders, they talked big about loving God. They made their prayers. They, they, they tried their ritual purity, their tradition. They put on more weight on, on uh, they, they put more weight on, they put weight on loving God. But, but they, they had a very narrow view about loving their neighbor. They stressed on every commandment in the, in the 613 commandments that are available in there. They made every effort to keep them all. But they failed to show love and mercy to those who are in need. You know, talking about this, one one writer writes, Jesus here is taking the questioners from the area of achievement, which he might conceivably fulfill, to that of an attitude where nobody can boast about fulfillment. He goes on to say, You know, they were strong on ethics, but they were weak on relationships. Weak on relationships. Friends, by adding a second commandment to the first and saying that it is like it, Jesus connects love for our neighbors to the love of God. Jesus does not just identify love of God with love of neighbor, but he indicates that two are inseparable. Inseparable. And loving God includes imitating His love by extending our love to those who, who love God and even to those who, who hate God and us. Literally, we love the love we practice towards others is an index of our love for God. It's an index for our love for God. You know, we cannot keep saying that, you know, we love God, but continue to aid our brothers and sisters and be, be mean towards each other by our words and by our actions. Apostle John, uh, in his epistle in, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 20, writes very clearly and blatantly, says, If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. Says. For he who does not love is his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. John straight out says, you are a liar. If you, if you are to paraphrase what he's trying to say, it simply means, in other, in other words, you do not have the right love of God within you. You don't have the right relationship with God. Until we fully commit and surrender to, to, to the Lord, and fully love Him with all of our hearts, with all of our being, we will not be able to show our love to our neighbors around us. Only after experience, experiencing the full and truly experiencing the God's mercy and grace through faith and trust in Jesus, we can show the same mercy and grace to others. Friends, the problem with, with us, with Christians, is that we are too focused on many other things, you know, our, our ritualistic programs, our traditions. We don't have enough time or our, our, our energy or we, we don't give enough, enough attention to love God, to listen to His Word, to obey Him. And that actually in turn uh, affects our outward expression of our faith. It all comes down to that. 
as a church, as, as, as God's people, many times we have failed to fulfill the commandment to love our, 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 our neighbors, our friends, our, our enemies even. We have failed to show kindness, mercy, whenever it was needed. We have been hard, ugly, nasty on many occasions. William Barclay, one of my favorite commentators, he writes about this and he says, more people have been brought into the church by the kindness of real Christian love than by all the theological arguments in the world. And more people have been driven from the church by the hardness and the ugliness of so-called Christianity than by all the doubts of the world. All the doubts of the world. And how much true is that? How true? Friends, it all comes down to our love for God. Our love for others is born out of our love for God. The scope of this command is not just limited to loving God, but it extends to showing the same love to those around us. Thirdly, we can see the supremacy of love in this command. When asked this question, Jesus could have picked any of the 613 commands that were found in the Old Testament. You know, that the Pharisees were familiar with. But he mentions the command to love as the greatest and as vital. In a sense, Jesus declares that this vertical relationship with God is the most important command of the scriptures. Only when your vertical relationship with God is fixed, you can horizontally Restore relationship with those around you. You know, most often our priority is reversed. The emphasis is placed on self-care and our relationship with, with, with one another. That's good. But only after, only that, after that comes your personal walk with God. How much time and emphasis do we put for our walk with Jesus? For our love. To spend time with Him. To pay attention to Him. Friends, because of this, this reversal, the mentality is to, is to work most of our work around our, our interpersonal skills and, and upon psychology, counseling, and, and you know, uh, work on ourselves to get better. All of this is good. But, but that is not dealing with the root cause. It's like when, 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 when someone broke a bone... You apply cream or, 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 or spray icy hot on the surface, on the skin to heal. Friends, the real issue is not being dealt with. We are trying to help someone on a temporary basis. But have not, that will not have lasting effects in their life. It's only when we can restore that relationship with Jesus when we can truly love God with all of our being, we can start to love others. Now when we, when we get our relationship with God healed, we find that our relationship with others will begin to get fixed in the process. Finally, from these verses, we can see the importance of this command. It is not only the first and the great commandment, but is also a fundamental base for all the other commandments and the words of God that we read in the scripture. In verses 40, Jesus says, on these two, com on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The English translation uses the word depend. You know, the English, English Bible uses the word depend. However, if you look at the original Greek Bible, the Greek word used here is called uh, krematai, which basically means to hang or suspend. Suspend. The word depend does not give us the full essence of the meaning Jesus is expressing here. On these two commandments, on love, the entirety of the law, the prophets, in other words, the gospel, the God's word hangs. Just picture this with me. The same way the door hangs on those two hinges, so does all the God's command hangs on these words, on this command to love. 
when I first read this uh, image, actually I, I uh, read the Greek Bible, the image that came to my mind was, was a string attached to these uh, two ends. If one is not attached, you don't be able to attach, hang anything on the string there. Even if one part of the commandment is not fulfilled, then you will be missing all the others. Friends, I can, I can come to church, I can be part of a group, I can tithe, I can preach every Sunday here. But if I don't love God with all of my being, and if I continue to hate my brothers and sisters, then I am missing my whole point. These two commands form the foundation of our living as Christians. And love is the guiding principle for interpreting and applying God's word in our lives. I'm going to invite the worship team. Uh, I'm going to conclude in a few minutes. Friends, Jesus, he does not just teach us this command, say like, go do this. But Jesus showed us and fulfilled this command. He not only taught this, but he fulfilled that. The Greek word that's used here uh, for love is, is agape. Agape. It's not found outside of the Bible. It's only found in the Bible. Agape love. It is the sacrificial love. Self-sacrificing love. It's not brotherly love. It's not erotic love. It's not... There's another word. Erotic love. Brotherly love. What's that? Family love, yes. But this is, agape is self-sacrificing love. In a way, Jesus is asking us to follow in his death. Calling us to love like him. We can love because he has showed us his love first. He has shown us his sacrificial love on the cross. And as people who have received and experienced this mercy, grace, and love through his sacrifice on the cross, we can follow in his path and show the same love for God with all of our being. And also show love to those around us, even our enemies. For some reason, you know, there's a beautiful verse in, in 1, 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. It says, And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Friends, the cross is the symbol of love. And for some reason, when I read, when I read the Greek translation, uh, Greek Bible, on these two commands hang the rest of the gospel. I could not take the image of the cross from my mind. Jesus on the cross. It's a symbol of love. There's a beautiful poem by Catherine Brandon, which I came across, uh, and I asked if I could use it. It's titled, Love Hung on the Cross. Let me read that for us before I pray. Some people wonder what love is, because they've never truly known the kind of love that gives everything and holds nothing back at, as its own. Pure love that, that does whatever it takes and suffers every conceivable loss. If you want to know what real love is, look at Jesus as he hung on the cross. They drove nails into his feet and hands. What torture our Savior did bear. But it, doesn't, but it wasn't those nails that held him. It was love that kept him there. He cared not a bit for his own life as they scorned and rejected him. Even as he died, his love was so great, he prayed, Father, please forgive them. He gave us love beyond any measure, beyond limits of time and space, beyond anything we could imagine. We are saved by his marvelous grace. Yes, it was because of his great love that Jesus counted his life well lost. If you want to know what real love is, look at Jesus as he hung on the cross. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for the love that you have showered upon us. The love that you showed us first, Father. The word says, while we were yet sinners, you came. You loved us first, Lord. You are a God who doesn't say, do this, do that, but you do it first. You show us the way, Father. And we thank you for the cross. God, help us to show the same love to those around us. But if there are people here who have not truly experienced your love, I pray that you will surround them this morning with your blessings. God, we give you glory. And I pray that you will help us to love you, love you and others like you. In Jesus' name we pray.